Hi, everybody. Ryan Rex Rex here with Aaron Rothy. You might know him from a project called Drop Dead Gorgeous. You might maybe you saw him play uh, keys with Kesha once. Maybe you knew he uh, he played keys with uh, Sonny Moore and Sonny Moore and the Blood Monkeys at one point. Heck, maybe you saw him in a 888. Who knows? But Aaron Rothy is a man of many talents, and I'm very excited to have him here today. How are you doing, Aaron? I'm good, man. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for that very nice intro as well. Yeah, I was just like, I, I remember our last interview and it was just like, man, this guy has done a lot. Aaron Rothy didn't just fade into the night after like, you know, Drop Dead Gorgeous, his second album came out. And then you were just kind of like, you know what, I gotta, I'm gonna do my own thing. And sometimes in the music scene of like emo, post hardcore, metalcore, screamo, whatever you want to call it, there's a big blanket term and a, a hot topic. I'm pretty sure it's all just known as that screamy music to that soccer mom, but Right. You're a man that just kept going, dude. Yeah, it's been a it's been a journey, but really fun. Heck yeah, dude. So um for those who may not uh be familiar with the legend that is Aaron Rothy, um, how did you get like started as a musician? Because I know you're a keyboardist, but you also have uh some singing credentials as well. I mean, you sang a song about what beautiful is. I mean, that's oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> wow um i started playing piano when i was five years old um i wanted to play electric guitar in a rock band that's what i wanted to do since i was a little kid and i just gravitated towards piano and had a knack for that i took some guitar lessons later on in life and i can play like basic chords but piano was my thing and i was like just i was just like determined to figure out how to make it cool because growing up I didn't I didn't really have any cool like I didn't grow up with bin folds or anything like that I grew up on like Christian music sheltered and then I heard something corporate when I was in like high school early high school heard Andrew McMahon like Hurricane specifically and that was the first time for me that I heard piano with rock music and it changed everything for me um so I finally had like an inspiration and then I started playing in a band in high school, singing and playing piano and started to write songs. And um, yeah, then that led to getting called in to do an, a, just a piano interlude for an EP for Drop Dead Gorgeous, who was just a local Denver band recording their first songs. And yeah, they... I, I I made up some like interlude in the studio and they're showing me their other songs. One of them is Love is Murder had a had a breakdown in it. And I was like, hey, while I'm here, what if, and I, I didn't even li really listen to that kind of music. I listened to all pop stuff and like Goo Goo Dolls and I don't know. But I was like, what if I tried to play some piano stuff over that breakdown? And they're, they said, okay, try it. And I did it. And then they had a little huddle and then they came back and they're like so do you want to be in our band i was like i don't know what i'm going to do in your band i don't know i I didn't hear i didn't listen to the genre much i didn't know what i was going to do with piano with it but i said yes and then it was a blast heck yeah i mean this would be like what 2004 2005 yeah i think 2000 probably 2005 yeah and this is like before like you know like Chiodos wasn't a big name. There wasn't like Attack Attack. There wasn't there wasn't any of these bands where it was like commonplace for like pianos and some synth no. and some it was like this was the early days. Like I think before this, you only had like a couple of examples of it, like Horse the Band and all you know, these bands my still, had still remains was doing it a yeah. little bit. Yeah. But, and it was like yeah, these like bands Chiodos, were like Chiodos was even around yet. Or they yeah. were just starting to like uh you know these the blood brothers i think would be another one that incorporated elements like that and it's just kind of like well while these bands were doing it it's like myspace had barely taken off music wasn't circulated like it is now where you could just type in a band name real quick or go on youtube and type in synthy piano breakdowns on this kind of music oh, it's like yeah. there was there was nothing like that there was no yeah. connection to it even myspace music was new like i remember yeah. the, when that launched like we were still doing pure volume yeah like it's yeah crazy it's like it's like people don't seem to 
know how good they have it now because while i feel like some bands struggle with how wide the net is cast there's a lot of access to just even from bands back then to today where it all just kind of connects as long as you like you find these genre labeling terms or find bands that sound similar but yeah. back then it was kind of just like bro who's doing piano breakdowns aaron rothy's doing piano breakdowns who else <laughs> <laughs> i don't know i'm sure there was some but i had a blast doing it heck yeah dude so like that would be like your first like because you played uh piano and you probably uh did some shows and stuff with your church and such before that but with drop dead gorgeous like going on tour in a band was that like your first experience of doing uh, something like that yeah very much i played in like i i learned how to play piano i would say by playing at church so the mm -hmm. first time that like somebody handed me just chords and i had to learn how to play chords what fit where how to improvise which led to like being able to write stuff um and then i started that band in high school but as far as anything that had any kind of traction or that people were actually listening to outside of like my friends and family yeah definitely drop dead so with the ep like that definitely like circulated were, were they signed to rise records at that point or did no. that happen on the first album no that happened after the ep so they had only played like maybe one like a house show maybe they were brand mm -hmm. new yeah and, uh, yeah we did the ep and we put that out and then played a few shows and then that started to get a bunch of traction on myspace oh yeah dude and that like gets you the attention and such. And it's like, I think that like a lot of people were doing like the heavy, hardcore, screaming, panic chords kind of stuff at that time. But there wasn't many that were incorporating like that beautiful piano tone because you'd have people like, you know, there's some people that play keys sure. on their, in their band and it's just kind of like C, yeah. D, C, D. And there's a lot of that. There's tons of that. Yeah. But, like that kind of like classical structure that wasn't prevalent you know before y'all like after y'all like it became like kind of like bands were trying to do it like with chiotos and then you had bands like in fear and faith and it's kind of just like every album needs to have strings and piano now like at a certain right. point in this scene because metalcore took off like in within like the 2010s and stuff and every yeah. band had to have keys and such yeah but that was yeah that was i didn't have a lot of like Inf I didn't have any influence or any yeah. reference at that point, but I was also new to the genre. I was like, really, I was intrigued by it and the whole like cultural phenomenon of like, I don't know, early 2000s or mid 2000s emo. Yeah. Scene, screamo music. Yeah. And like, I had no idea that I'd ever have a place in it. Yeah. Cause we were just talking about this, like before like the interview started, um, I recently shared a post about Drop Dead Gorgeous and like I don't even think back then you'd be like man a couple thousand people will, will like still remember this like 20 years later like you had no idea that you were stepping into some pioneer boots for a certain no. sect of society that just pines for those good old days you never I don't think anyone thinks that something they're doing at the current time like at the time they're doing it like wow this is gonna be nostalgic one day no not at all and especially Drop Dead like we like when it started like we're at least I can't speak for the other guys like it was fun and we were having a blast but I almost felt embarrassed like like I don't know there's so like this is the beginning of like internet trolls uh I don't know it's just I don't think anyone actually cared I thought it was like maybe cool for a moment but yeah. when you're in the middle of it you also don't see the reach you don't see any of that yeah and now i feel like i almost feel like it's bigger or more popular now than it was then well I, I i would agree with you because not only do you have the people that live through it you have these people now younger folks of course who have that feeling of missing out that fomo where it's kind of just like oh that was when real music was made and like growing up like when or the early days, days of the internet I used to hear people say that about the 80s or I'd hear them say about right, the yeah. 70s. And it's like, I don't think like when they were listening to their tunes back then in high school or 
early days of college that they were going to be like, well, this band's going to be around forever. And it's like sometimes those bands are just kind of like, you know, a flash in a moment. They're, they're intense while the scene is happening. And then the afterfold, and you have to kind of just like sit back and watch them like, wow, that really happened. Yeah. And that's very much what I thought Drop Dead was going to be. So yeah, your post, I was shocked to see <laughs> that, that many people liked it, commented or reshared it. And yeah, it's, it's wild. Definitely. Definitely agree with that post sentiments of like of all those bands because you there's a lot of those bands that come back and uh, obviously Drop Dead Gorgeous with the loss of Kyle and such reunion yeah. plans and you know reunion talks are kind of put on the back burner while you guys grieve and care and you know that's that's someone that you guys grew up with and it's just like you know you guys created this beautiful thing so it's just kind of like respect on that that and you know danny still does does music he just released something recently under a new uh band name and stuff like yeah, that so it's kind of just like you guys are all doing your own things now these days yeah it's yeah it's interesting like we yeah i none of us are really like i hear from stills every once in a while we keep in touch i was actually just texting him i'm gonna show you this he's gonna hate this but <laughs> I, texted, I don't know how i found this um someone did this drawing of him based off of a picture that he posted when he was fishing once this is a few years ago when we had a different band called 888 yeah great band everyone should go check it out but yeah here's stills picture with a fish and then somebody <laughs> made that drawing of him and i found it i don't know how i came beautiful across my phone. that's art right there it's I literally just texted it to him and then I to make him feel better, somebody drew this of me with some cookies. <laughs> Uncanny, right? Yeah, the, the, it's yeah. it's the exact same person twice. I remember yeah. when yeah. I remember when your hair was like that. <laughs> I know it's wild. I, I yeah, people. It's fun to show people the old, the old emo days, the scene days with the long hair. Because my hair was like down to here and like curly and. Oh yeah, 2007. Funny, we used to dye our roots red, and yeah, Billy Alice is ripping that off now. Just kidding. It, it's kind of it, it, hey, you guys are trendsetters, man. It's just like it's hard. It's hard to be uh, ahead of the curve. You know, you don't want to like create a fashion trend, and nobody was doing it back then. Now it's like, oh, now everybody's doing it. Well, I remember, <laughs> right? But the thing is, like, we weren't doing it on purpose. We didn't know. We we're just like. Do you want to look cool? <laughs> yeah. It's dire roots. It's like, you ever played with chemicals before? Um, It sounds fun if it makes my hair like all bright. Oh, yeah. Like neon. I had every color hair. My hair was falling out. We were not using gloves. And yeah. I, I, I miss the overly processed hair days, dude. Like, I remember, I, I met, like, I like my hair now, obviously. I have a lot right. of it. And, but back in the day, like, my hair yeah. would, my, my hair follicle wouldn't be straight. It would just be like kind of like a zigzag, just oh, fried. Good. And then the hair straightener on top of that. Oh yeah, we were we were I just like how to use those, just <laughs> destroying my hair. Yeah, it would feel soft like when you first start when 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 the addiction begins with flat ironing your hair. It's like your hair looks and feels like the most magic it's ever been. But then when you start mixing, you know, chemicals it's like into a the hairstylist mix. doing it, but I didn't know I had to put like a serum in it and all of a sudden I was just dry straightening it and yeah. And it's like, I, don't do it when it's wet. It's like, but it's wet. I need it dry. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Dude, ridiculous. It's it's a it's a uh, tangled web to weave. You know, when you just say it, it, it's like an addiction. You know, you're like, well, it looks like shit. I, it's my black's gone, and now my 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 blonde's growing in, and how I have to make these two colors. I'll make it red, and it will just be a little darker exactly. at the end. And... <laughs> yep. And then after about a year of doing that, your hair is just like a weird chemical mixture that's kind of like way too frizzy and fuzzy. And you're just like, I don't know if I'm turning into a sheep or. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Like, yeah. Such good times. Yeah. But I think Sonny was known for doing putting bleach on just about anything. His hair, his clothes and just. Oh, yeah, I was just... everything. Yeah. And for those who don't know, like, because Sonny Moore had left from first to last 
and that was around the same time that you had left Drop Dead Gorgeous, correct? Yeah. And you're just you're just two dudes on MySpace sharing DMs, and he's just kind of like working on the Bells EP, which I think he did the Gypsy Hook EP, and then he was supposed to transition, but Atlantic Records kind of like stuck their thumb in that. And I think you guys only worked on the demos that appeared on like MySpace, correct? Yeah, we did. We actually did a full length. It just never came out. So some of the stuff that was on the EP. Uh, gosh, I don't even remember. It didn't come out. I know there's talks of Atlantic and certain labels, but yeah, we, he did a full record. But we met. Oh, my gosh. There's the weirdest story of how I met him was through a girl I met on MySpace who I just turned 18. This is before Drop Dead, too. And she lived in Wisconsin. And I was like, oh, I have a, I'm talking to this girl online. She must be awesome and exactly who she says she is because who knew better? And so I drove out to Wisconsin and we became, like, I had a great time. She was awesome. But she said that oh she had this hoodie it's like really small hoodie that was bleached it had like a rib cage thing on it and she told me that Sonny gave it to her and i was like i was a big from first to last fan i was like no way and i want to wear it and she let me like i took it home and then we stopped i stopped speaking to her but i found at some point Sonny's like personal myspace and I didn't know if he was fake or not, but I sent him a picture of it. I was like, hey, weird thing. This girl said that this is your hoodie. And it was awesome. It was definitely like a custom, like, bleached thing. It looked like something he wore. Um, if it's yours, I really just wanted to know him. So I was like, if it's yours, happy to ship it back to you. And, like, a month went by. He didn't see the message. And he finally wrote back. And I was, like, kind of freaking out. And he's like... That's not mine, but he's like, I'll pay you 50 bucks for it. I was like, oh, no, you don't have to do that. I'll just send it to you. And he's like, awesome. And just like sends me his address. And I sent it out to him. And yeah, and then he was coming through town. He was coming through Denver on the, I think it was right when, right before heroin came out. And we met up at a coffee shop with it was him and Skyler from um he is legend oh wow kind of became they were on tour together and kind of became friends and then I invited him to a show or uh, drop deads for a show when we played Los Angeles for the first time at the whiskey a go-go nice and he came out and yeah we just stayed in touch on myspace and texting and he was like hey uh don't tell anyone this but i'm going to be leaving from first to last i'm not sure when yet but i've been working on some other music i need a keyboard player for or a piano player when i started would you be interested i was like no way <laughs> like <laughs> so, hmm. so we were sending demos and th that happened like we were, he so he was like texting me that kind of stuff, like on Drop Dead's first tour. Yeah. So this was over a couple of years, and we were sending demos back and forth. And uh, when we did the record with Ross Robinson, who did Heroin from from first to last, um, Sonny was a part of that. He did some programming and production stuff on it, and we were hanging. And yeah, then it just got to a point for both of us in our bands that we were going to leave and. It was just it just worked out perfect. So he had he had already left. He was starting a new project. He had some tours coming up, and I left Drop Dead and I moved out to L.A. like a week later and moved in with him. <laughs> yeah. So when Sunny Moore asked you, you want to do keys? Did it take you like a second to respond, or was it just like you had to pretend like, hmm? Oh no, I was like <laughs> yes yeah like why not like hell yeah dude I, this all started off from a hoodie from a girl that lied like let's go <laughs> no it's just it's so crazy like i always tell when people have asked like well how did you meet sonny i was like well he was in a band that was a similar genre as mine and we toured and warped tour and all this it's like no it's actually 
before Drop Dead, and this girl lied about knowing him, and I messaged him on MySpace. So crazy. It's so weird. Like, you know, back in the day, our parents used to tell us, don't talk to strangers on the internet. It, it only lead to bad oh, well, stuff. Well, we didn't then. I shouldn't have. Like, I had... <laughs> catfishing wasn't a thing yet like i drove from denver to milwaukee to meet a girl like it's crazy you know and you're young it. it's just, <laughs> you just, yeah it's wild your young heart was looking for love <laughs> or a sunny more hoodie you know it's it's one of those things <laughs> i don't know yeah i guess I don't. Th- I don't think people seem like if you didn't grow up during MySpace times. If if anyone was to tell you like this is emo, it would usually be a picture of Sonny Moore. Like if the, how oh, did the yeah, kids dress? Yeah. It's that was the guy that all the other guys that wanted to eyeliner, like... the the hair, the, everything, man. And I mean, if you look, he's set trends at every single thing that he's ever done. Yeah, was literally. When... We, we, we went through trends. a long period of... And he has also... He's brilliant. He knows when to move on. Mm-hmm. And he's... Yeah. He's gonna... Yeah. He's a brilliant guy. I mean, we, we both grew up during a period of time. It was like a good five, six years where this side... Of, like one side of your head was shaved. And it was just like, mm-hmm. why is... What? Like, I remember that. <laughs> which was a pain in the ass to grow back. They don't tell you that part. <laughs> it gets to be this long and sticking straight out and you can't do anything with it. you have a very long awkward face and it's like i yeah. feel like like davy havoc kind of had like the prototype of that haircut a little bit you know it was definitely more emo driven where the bang had to be in the face but that just lawnmower shave patch like once it was a skrillex thing it was an everyone thing and it was just like it was everywhere yeah. And it's it's you still see people to this day still doing it. It's it's part of the it's part of the lexicon. Like broccoli hair is very interesting now. And you got yeah. uh well now it's like now they're doing like these little like mullets. They're like acceptable mullets. Fashion mullets. We had those, Fashion remember? <laughs> oh god. Yeah. Oof. The mullet always Dude, seems to make so, a comeback. <laughs> We can't get rid of the mullet. Whoever whoever was like the star king who started the mullet, you know, he's in the same echelon as Sonny with the side patch or whatever the heck. This is so bad. I got tagged in this video. It's so weird, man. Like I'm getting tagged or like just drop dead stuff is coming up all the time. It hasn't come up like I it's been almost 20 years. I'm pretty sure. You guys got anniversaries coming for records and stuff yeah. like that. That you were reminded every year that you guys are a band that existed at one point. And I don't think the fact that it was good on top of how iconic it was. I like don't, you, yeah. You don't think it was good? You think it was I don't know. It was I don't have an opinion about it, I guess. <laughs> I mean I would say it's good when a lot of the modern like math core scene kind of like just sounds like they're doing like a really good drop dead and gorgeous impression. I mean, there's yeah, so many bands just, now. That... I mean, we were just essentially trying to do a really good Norma Jean impression <laughs> just with the dissonant chords, but <laughs> I, don't know. So I mean, weird. it's impressionist art. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's wild. I'm getting tagged in these videos that, I don't know where this footage came from. Like, I have no record. Like, this feels, Drop Dead feels like it was like a blink, like a weird dream, like five lifetimes ago. It's just, it's, that's how it feels. And so there's all this footage that people are compiling. I don't remember any of it, but it's like, there, there's a show that uh, the first time we met Jeffrey Starr, he came out and saw us at the Glass House in Pomona. And like, this, there's like a video shot of, like us taking photos with him for the first time or meeting him. But somebody had one of those mullets. And I forgot <laughs> how bad they are. It might have been they had the mullets and they got the, the high angle, like you know, you know, make sure you take the picture. The camera's gotta be like all the way up oh, here. Yeah. You have that dynamic posing. I think that's a lost art. And I think we should bring it back, Aaron. You you're, you I'm good on that. <laughs> I'm no. <laughs> There's enough. Google doesn't forget. It doesn't. 
it, that's how I that's the everything that's how I know about your your EP with, with songs like uh, you're what beautiful is you know like I remember Dude, so you okay this to... is funny my girlfriend now so actually I don't know I wrote that song in high school like this is a few years before drop dead mm -hmm. or a girl I put it on MySpace I put it on pure volume actually and then I put it on MySpace but I got like all these plays and like I had like 5 million plays or something like that on just on MySpace. And I was at a brewery like six months ago and just went to pay for my tab, put my card down. And the waitress came back and she's like, okay, this is going to sound really weird, but are you a musician? I was like, yeah. Uh, why? Because I don't, I don't look the same. I don't have like that. Like my life is entirely different from like being recognized in malls at Hot Topic now. Um, she's like, did you write a song called What Beautiful Is? I was like, oh my gosh. Yes. Yeah, damn it. <laughs> and it was their MySpace song. But actually my girlfriend now, who is from North Carolina, I was not, had no idea about anything about me playing music at all when I met her and started dating her um eventually i don't know it came up but she had that song on her myspace it's just it's so <laughs> it blows my mind like it was a banger i'm so glad that i did not know that anyone would care about any of this stuff because i've if i would have thought that 20 years later like giving someone my card to pay my tab was gonna be like did you write a song like it's just <laughs> life's weird man it's so weird it's flattering like it's it's awesome i'm not complaining but that was a banger ep it like you could you could definitely like listening to it now like the andrew mcmahon like if people that was around the time like uh because something corporate was about the end and then he was doing jack's mannequin and yep. like there was lots of just like there wasn't a whole lot of that but then it's like as the time went on you had bands like play radio play and then mm -hmm. the most random of all people owl city kind of blew up with that kind of like you know that little synthy sound of just kind of like moving yeah. along but kind of like bedroom pop cutesy yeah i would i would feel like you are well you know you are what beautiful is is one of them kind of songs where it just feels like a bedroom pop anthem bro i guess <laughs> but it wasn't there was no reference there's no inspiration like i wasn't following a genre i just wrote a song for a girl yeah <laughs> it just so happens that your audience it's a bunch of emo kids. <laughs> I wasn't then. I don't I had no idea. I will say though, and actually space. one of the highlights of my entire like music, everything is well, I listened to the Rocket Summer a lot. Mm -hmm. He was always doing the piano stuff. Yeah. In a much more poppy way. Mm -hmm. And I looked up to him so much. I did warp tour and dropped it to warp tour in 2007 mm -hmm. And I watched the rocket summer every single day it was right when uh do you feel came out and i was like way too nervous to talk to him but then when i the first tour i did when i started playing with sunny was the alternative press tour and rocket summer was a co-headliner for that and so i got to know bryce do that then years later and we didn't we weren't friends or anything really then years later in 888 he reached out and because he heard one, one of our songs and he wanted to write and then he took us on tour but he remembered me from playing with Sonny anyways he's become a really good friend which Heck is yeah crazy, because it took a very long time for me to be able to be friends with him and not just be kind of starstruck actually <laughs> um, yeah I Rocket Summer was a huge influence and he was doing the piano and the love songs and like uplifting like positive message kind of stuff yeah so would you ever i mean i, I i'm sure you guys have a, an easy correlation now where it's not so much like nice to see you brad like would you guys ever consider like i don't know if you did with 888 but would you guys ever consider like collaborating on music um we've never talked about it but i would <laughs> that would be sweet man he's such a creative force i don't think he needs to collaborate with anybody he does it all himself and he keeps reinventing I... it that's like like i just want him to keep doing what he's doing i don't want to get in the way of that 
I, 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 I'm just saying, as a, a fan of the Rock of Summer and Aaron Rothy, I would just say that that would be probably like one of like I know. Don't sell yourself short now. Uh, that would be an epic collaboration of uh MySpace magnitude. I'm just saying. Yeah, it'd be awesome. It was the fun. This is the most fun tour I've ever done in my life, and it was because he was so hospitable and we formed a, a really cool friendship. And he's hilarious, so Heck yeah, dude. Lots of great inside jokes. But he and I would stay up till it was it was getting to be a problem, especially for him because he's a singer. But we'd stay up on the bus till like five thirty in the morning most nights, just telling stories and talking and everything. It was awesome. Well, you're you're a great person to talk to, so I can understand. Like uh, having been on the receiving end of a uh, three four a.m. Uh, phone call with Aaron Rothy, just like yeah, so when, yeah. When we first like set up like an interview, I remember we talked like for like an hour or two online. Like yeah, it started texting, and you're like, "Dude, can I call you real quick?" And you just gave me like a bunch of stories. I was just like, "Dude, this is so cool." Aaron Rothy's like the nicest guy, so it's it's cool that you can radiate with somebody that you find like as a uh, inspiration maybe an influence or just someone you admire so much that like, yeah, able to share that like you know i i can relate because you're you're a cool guy aaron you're a cool guy to talk to you? and i love that picture of us at warped i think it was warped tour when i met yeah, you that's warped tour i don't remember 2007 it. that's so <laughs> wild dude you gotta put that picture in this yeah, I, I will definitely do that because uh, you had like the awesome roots growing in and everything, dude. It was oh, just, and you killed it on the piano. Especially on that. We weren't showering or any, uh, Warp <laughs> Tour was gross. What well, do you think? You think it's going to come back? Warp Tour? Um, yeah. I mean, we have Warp Tour water, and I don't know why they would bring Warp Tour water without the tour i don't i didn't hire it's everybody one. I, I wish we had warp tour water i i usually they drop the water and they were just like i wish we had warp tour <laughs> what's warp tour water just the cans like the cans that uh artists would get you know yeah. and everybody would think you guys are drinking monster on stage but it's really just like a can of water yeah they yeah. sell that now that's the first time it. also drinking can that's the first time i drank canned water it was really weird <laughs> how like, was your experience I will uh, my experience with it. I uh I don't know what I would expect from a metal can of water, but <laughs> it didn't. It tasted, uh, in 120 degree weather, it tasted like 120 degree aluminum can of water. It was disgusting. Yeah, mm, it's just oh boy, I um I almost feel like you guys were tortured on work tour. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I think it was just. There was just something about Warp Tour because it was kind of like, well, all your favorite cool ass bands are playing on the main stage, but in these uprising bands. So while you're on your way to go see your favorite band, you're like, whoa, these guys over here are kicking some butt, like on stage playing some like heavy riffs or doing some yeah. bedroom pop like synths real quick. Let me just stop by right here. And it was just like, there's not really anything like that now. It's kind of just like, here's all these bands on this stage. You're in front of this stage. Have fun. <laughs> yeah. I don't think there's as much. I mean, there's still like festivals that happen, but the discovery aspect of like discovering a new band was so much easier at Warped Tour. And I don't know exactly why. I feel Maybe like there were bands and not DJs, but like, yeah, I don't know. that helps. And I feel like um, it had a swap meet feel to it a little bit. Because yeah. all these tents, they weren't all in corners. It wasn't all like it surrounds everything. It was kind of like, we're going to put a bunch of tents like, right here in the middle. And people kind of have to like walk by. And it kind of created like that carnival aspect to it. Where it yeah. was just kind of like bands are like, well, how am I going to get fans if I'm not like trying to get there? To hey, come here, come here. <laughs> Listen yeah, to totally. Them. And like, like people like spray painting their band names on people. And like, it's just awesome just getting creative with it just a bunch of people just trying to like how do we splinter into the mind of somebody and like have them remember us like next week let alone 20 years from now yeah it works and i just i don't think there is that because like you got big giant festivals like coachella like i, I think the one 
that would apply to our demographic uh would be like when we were young but i yeah. feel like that's uh, i don't remember warped her having tears you had vip passes and people could be like they can go walk into certain areas that where artists had to mingle with them but when we were young just based on like the last few years that i've seen it just kind of seems like well if you want to be in front of the stage it's going to cost like 300 dollars and everyone else has general access they're behind a certain barrier and it's just like yeah and also i don't know if i'm jaded because i've done warp tour and i've done every festival that you can play but i'm not going to pay 300 dollars to go to a music festival in the middle of the desert in the middle of the summer to be like fifty thousand people back to see my chemical romance yeah i feel I, some will I feel. i'm i'm probably jaded to, and Actually, I know I am, but that sounds like a nightmare to me. Paying I like mean, how much for a water? Like, uh, yeah, if, if Warp Tour was usually done in the dead of heat of summer, um, when we were young, it's done in October. And the first instance, like they tried planning it like post pandemic, it got canceled day one because of wind. And then you're out $300 for that ticket you paid for. <laughs> It's a yeah. weird gamble. I don't know why. Like, cause I always like Taste of Chaos because it was in an arena mm. tour. It was indoors. Yeah. And we did that in seemed... Australia with the used and Rise Against and yeah. Gallows. They're from the UK. And what else was on it? I don't remember. But yeah, we got we got added last minute because Escape the Fate was supposed to be on it and they had to drop off because Ronnie Radke is a monster and couldn't leave the country. So <laughs> oh. oh man, I I I I just find that funny. It has nothing to do with the fact that I interacted with him this week. <laughs> oh you did? I'm sorry. It was horrible. Glad you made it. I think every single tour that I can't believe that guy's still around and I don't care. I'll say it public I'd say it to his way. I don't know how he's not so canceled on so many levels, but I think it's just uh, oh. one of those things where, um, at least at our level in the scene, because uh, I mean we're not mainstream. Even the most popular underground band at their highest peak. I mean, the highest peak was like twenty years ago when bands like The Used were on MTV and stuff like that. Nowadays, it's like, oh, you got a couple hundred thousand million maybe views on YouTube. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the other billion people on Earth aren't paying attention to that. And it's yeah. not in front of our face like Jay-Z and Beyonce. So it's just kind of one of those things that's real. Well, not enough people care. Yeah, I think more people should care because I don't know. people. Who There's are... a lot of great artists in the scene that aren't that guy. And yeah. unfortunately, outrage culture kind of breeds attention and it's one of those things it does and it's I just like for every tour that he ever does should be called the predator <laughs> dead serious i mean aaron rothy has been on tour and has seen some things i mean i'm not i've been on tour with saying, rothy and seen some things so it's fine people talk and it's just it's something that circulates and it's just like you know i don't know i met him at that tour i met you warp tour and yeah. I took it. This is when his got his, his got you moment. Oh, you! I'm in a picture with you. I was like, no, I took that picture. The person in that picture is my ex's brother, and you were a dick to him, and he was a fan of you. And this was like 2007. Skip the fate. While extremely popular on MySpace, it's just kind of one of those things where, in my mind, when I'm taking this picture, I'm just like, bro, like I'm not a fan of you now. From now on, I don't want to be a fan of you just because you're being a dick to somebody. I don't even know who your band is, but you're being a dick to somebody that looks up to your band like, <gasps> and it's just like, nowadays, it's just like he just picks someone at random and he's like, I'm going to be a dick to this person just because. And then my fan base will bully them. And it's just kind of like a weird militant thought process. I don't get it. And it's just, it's just I'm just not in support of people being terrible to people. It's yeah. Just, it doesn't need to happen. And that's, that's where I'm coming from. I don't, I don't know him personally anymore or anything, but, um, yeah, there's just yeah. nothing good happening. I don't, I don't know. I think there's a lot more positive out there to do that could benefit everybody. And it's just like, 
creating dissension not only on a musician level but a fans level like you got to be over here and over here i don't know division doesn't doesn't multiply you know and it's just like i feel like with a scene that used to be you know have a major tour like warp tour and taste of chaos all this support that this kind of behavior doesn't make another one of those tours a tour that could benefit so many different people not just like oh it's my tour and these four bands that i i selected and that mm -hmm. are paying me a buy on are gonna benefit from like a warp tour benefits so many people not just at a label level but a local level at a battle of the bands level like you could go play on warp tour and it's just like it helped so many different people and it was unbiased and it wasn't I mean, that's one of the reasons why Kevin Lyman said that it fell apart was because band dudes just want to beef and just it becomes drama fest every year. And it's just, yeah, we did. We did it to ourselves. We ruined our own scene with allowing <laughs> people like that to like be bigger and better and sell all these tickets or whatever it is that they're doing yeah. that attracts all this. Attention. I mean, that that's always going to exist in music. It exists in every single industry also. But yeah. I don't want to dog or like put a negative light or whatever on the whole scene because there's so much good and there's so much amazing community. It's like still the fact that we're having a conversation almost 20 years later is yeah. incredible. Incredible. Yeah. So it does a lot of good. And there's a lot of good people out there that just want to see good sure. things happen for other people. Cause I remember the last time we did the interview, you were working with, uh, name escapes me was in lydia you were uh working on love, love. yes Indy, but, yeah and i don't know if that her works ever came out or something like that but it, and you should check it out it's amazing she's one of the most talented and one of the best friends i've ever had in my life but yeah heck yeah and it's just like that's the kind of energy you need you know that like that to help folks and to like spread that love and if people wanted to find that on spotify how would they go about like what, what do they have to type to bring uh, up mindy this white mindy white it's mindy white yeah it's incredible we did a ep with her it's still we're still releasing songs gradually but um it was over covid she and her husband live in florida and me and uh the guy that i produced co-produced it with taylor lived in Colorado and we did the whole thing over FaceTime and an app called audio movers that would allow her to listen to what we were recording she's not really an instrumentalist she can play piano and work melody but she's an incredible vocalist and an incredible writer so yeah. just I don't know the production process she was able to listen in high quality real time as we were producing the track and building stuff and then she'd like press pause on FaceTime, go and track a vocal and send it over. And we, it's actually amazing that it worked out and it worked so well. Heck yeah, dude. We did the whole thing remotely and it's really good. I'm so proud of it. That's what's up. So like, is uh along like uh, outside uh mindy white is there any other artists that you are currently working with or worked with recently that you think people should be put on to oh yes so i've kind of gravitated more towards doing some production songwriting stuff but more so just management artist management um i'm kind of done i'm always gonna be writing and but i don't have like the the passion that I had to like pursue an artist career I really enjoy mm -hmm. artist development I learned like I went all over the world I did this for like 15 16 years I learned a lot of stuff and I want to be like who I wish I had around watching my back when I was 18 and got signed um so I have a handful of artists that I work with um there's one for the rock stuff. He's incredible. Uh, his name's Ethan. Uh, the project is called Jake's a Gentleman. And he just put out an EP in the last year. Um, and we're just starting to play shows and, and build that up. But it, it's some of the best rock and writing that I've, I've heard in a very long time. So definitely check him out. Um, and that's, I, I really think it's just a matter of time before that just blows up. 
Um, also work with uh, kind of a pop alternative pop artist named Sophie Gray. You can check out. Mm-hmm. Um, I have an incredible country artist. I'm not a country music guy until I heard this girl. Her name is Kayla Ruby. Um, I've been working with her for like probably six years now. Um, mm-hmm. She's incredible. Um, and so those are like the main three that I am really working with now, but all worth checking out and they're doing amazing things and i'm really excited heck yeah dude i love that too and it's not just like oh it's just this specific genre it's like it's expensive because you like you know better than anybody that if you were just to limit yourself to one specific type of genre or music that you're not going to be able to find the most interesting stuff because it's just kind of like you got to try different things and you're like i'm not a country guy but then i heard this and now all of a sudden this is country to me (laughs) yeah yeah exactly and most country i hate but and i will always hate but this oh yeah also like if i'm managing artists like i don't want to have everyone like doing the same thing otherwise like it's hard like if they're all like competing and they're all in the same lane what am i how can i like be fair about representing them and different opportunities so yeah i get it and without a doubt dude like um so you say like like artist development and stuff kind of just like wishing that you had somebody to like watch your back is there like a moment in your career or doing music where you're kind of like i wish there was somebody right here behind me like oh yeah pretty much all of it especially the whole drop dead process I wish like we got so, so, so taken advantage of from our manager, from our tour manager. Um, We didn't, we were so young and we were so new to it and it happened really fast. Like it was one day we're, I don't know. I was eight, I think 19, 18, just out of high school, but drummer and guitar player were 15 and still in high school and it just it just blew up one day on myspace and then we signed to rise records and then we did the in vogue before that even came out we already signed to interscope and it was just like this we didn't have anyone and like our parents were trying to look out but the music industry is crazy and your parents are your parents and they're not like for sure music music lawyers that have know the ins right. and, and outs. We, we had a lawyer but that was all he was also like and i don't know i think he was actually legit but i don't think i don't know there's just there's so much room for i don't know corruption and dishonesty and bands and artists get taken advantage of so easily and yeah so i'm kind of like that's a big motivating factor i was like i'm not gonna let anyone like you're going to get to this artist, you're going through me. You're not going to take advantage of them. And it's been, it's been cool. That's yeah. Good, like we had, I think, I don't know. Okay. I have ideas of how much money and things were stolen from us. And it's in the seven figures. Of course, because you guys were a big deal and you remain a big deal it's not like one of those things where people don't remember dropped it gorgeous it's not like one of those things where dress for friends request is not a profile song that everyone had at one point i mean if a song that didn't have major label backing you are what beautiful is can be brought up to you 20 years down the line i think something like you know, um, Travis Richter speaks about this um, for Dear Diary, My Teen Angst Has a Body Count. If yeah. all the plays from websites like Kaza and MySpace and all this other stuff counted the way they do now, guys like you're, you, Drop Dead Gorgeous, and bands like from First Life, they would have gold records. They would have platinum certification. They would have more money in their pockets for something that was kind of just like the Wild West back then. And it was not and if you don't have the right tour managers or band managers or a label's not looking out for you, they're only looking out for themselves. There's so many things that can go wrong that don't go right for people that work so tirelessly, going 
going on tour or doing the press tour for all this music yeah. that gets released. And if it doesn't sell a billion records, well, that band's a failure. And it's just like, that's not how it works. Oh, yeah. The industry is, I mean, it's never been great, but it's so different now. Like yeah. labels, they're not taking chances on anything. So you got to be already like, just the biggest thing off the charts <laughs> but streaming show attendance all of it's got to be already there and at that point if you already have that all set up and you did it yourself why would you sign like 70 percent of that over to a label right it's gonna like want you to do a single and then shelve you and then you're stuck it's just yeah. not every label is like that but most are yeah the higher you up you go the longer tenure they yeah. have you know if certain record labels were around in the 50s and 60s it's like they're probably very uh well versed in how to screw you over <laughs> for sure but i'm excited because there's a new generation now that's starting to take over they're the new executives and it's it's people that we came up with it's people mm -hmm. that played in the same bands that like i toured with and we 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 saw it and went to shows they're starting to like as the older generation is uh, retiring, thank God. Yeah. So I think there's actually a lot of hope for some like really good change, hopefully. I don't know. And it's just like, I think it's pretty evident that the old model doesn't work. It worked at one point because the world was different. There wasn't so many avenues. There wasn't all these different places to go on the web. TikTok, TikTok or, or yeah. Yeah, like TikTok, like you, something gets popular there, all of a sudden, everybody all over the world knows about it. And then that's their favorite thing. And that's kind of like the new method of blowing up or getting MySpace it's famous. It's such a flash in the pan. It's like, how do you, yeah. And I think that's the challenge of what artists need to figure out. It's like, how do you have any longevity after you go viral or blow up or whatever? Yeah, and it's just like, creating something like a sustainable momentum that can only benefit you and i've always found that bands like it's very prevalent in the it, it was always prevalent in the rap scene especially me growing up especially still now but i see a lot of bands doing features nowadays yeah. and it's one of those things where collaborative efforts seem to work out a lot better for people and i feel like you're somebody that's definitely benefited from the collab. Like, I mean, you've worked with some interesting people from Ross Robinson to West Borland to freaking, you know, it's Kesha. <laughs> I mean, the almost, ability. Almost, I didn't play for, I auditioned for her, but I didn't play for her. Almost. Set the record. Please. But it's funny. And one of my like closest friends, I'll be, he's like a lifelong friend, but he lives in Los Angeles. He, he's a front of house engineer for like Lil Nas X and Olivia Rodriguez, like every big thing. But he was her front of house um, when I moved to LA and auditioned for her. And he, she wasn't there for the audition, but he was filming it. And somewhere there's a videotape of me having to do the TikTok dance because that's right when that song came out and i was like hell no i was like i came here to play the song and it's catchy but i'm not trying to do dance moves on stage especially tiktok <laughs> nope tiktok I... on the clock <laughs> they're like okay yeah you actually don't even have to plug your keyboard in but if you can do this for us i was like oh that was my introduction to los angeles so <laughs> They want me to do what now? <laughs> I think I actually got picked. It was between me and one other keyboard player. And then she decided to use that budget to bring out uh, two backup dancers or something like that. Which hey, is essentially what we were anyways. So Maybe you helped them get to that point. You know, like there was like, you know what? His his keyboard wasn't even plugged in. Why we're thinking too hard? <laughs> <laughs> I might maybe. I think they're ahead of me on that. But wow. But, um, I if I if I could bring up one more drop dead gorgeous question. Yeah. If that, so 
that's because uh, a lot a lot of people you know dress for friends request. That's the first album. The second album, which was a creative shift, I feel like you know, and some people will probably bring that up to y'all. But I think one thing about that album that definitely stands the test of time and helps it remain like give it that longevity to it was like the concept behind it, which kind of like you guys all pull together. While the vibe was definitely different, it was definitely uh, it had a true crime vibe to it, and I don't. Very, it's a true crime like kind of gritty. Right. Let's go on a detective mystery. Like, what was like the thought process? Was that like a band effort, or was that kind of just like Danny's writing the lyrics and this is what he's doing? Yeah, uh, I mean that all came from Danny, from Danny Stills. I mean he created, uh, like he wrote all the lyrics. He came up with the concept. He was a big true crime uh, fan. But that record is, man. So that wasn't the record that we wrote originally. That's not what we went out to LA to record. We had written a bunch of stuff that was like, in my opinion. I think in all of our, I could probably speak for all of us. It was like the perfect follow-up to In Vogue. That wasn't mm -hmm. so much of a departure, but once we got to LA and in with Ross and then he was bringing in like Sid and Paul from Slipknot and uh, every, and he also just like kind of made us like, we did so much pre-production and we scratched everything. So we started basically from scratch in this new kind of sound. And it's it's what Ross is best at and what he's known for. And it's also what makes him the biggest pain in the ass. Is like he's just he's he's an eccentric guy. Um mm -hmm. so it was it was hard. getting that record done took a lot longer and a lot more money. That record cost over a million dollars to make. Really? Easy. Yeah. Easily. Damn. That's and this crazy. is like that that was a lot of money back. And this is when like labels still had a budget. Like our I think our budget for that was actually like three hundred and something thousand. Mm -hmm. Which is a still a shit ton of money to make a record. Yeah. But this was like the end of labels like funding that kind of stuff, like thousand dollar dinners and taking us on shopping sprees and the whole thing. Um, but yeah, because it went through so many phases and then like, I don't know, but it was, it was really difficult to even get that record released because that was the debut record on Suretone, which was part of Interscope. Uh, it was a yeah. sub-label Interscope and, but still Jimmy Iving was like signing off on it essentially. And he's yeah. like what the frick is this like because it doesn't sound good at all like it's not a good sounding record sonically <laughs> sonically it is not like that appealing it does it didn't sound like what el all the like is like clean and i don't know big as the other records there's a lot more grungy and like dirty yeah. everything was like all the tracks were run through effects pedals and so it just has that feel to it but the concept mm -hmm. thing we're super excited it didn't really have any kind of success for us at all it was i mean by all means like industry-wise a total flop i would say but when it came out we unappreciated it in its time aaron i don't think it was a bad record i don't think i'm not I saying think... it's a bad record <laughs> i'm saying it's just like it wasn't it was so much of a departure and there was this, yeah, there was a lot of drama behind the making of that record. Firing yeah. band members and sending them home. And then Ross brought in West Borland to do all the bass, which is one of my most proud things ever because I'm a huge Little Biscuit fan. Mm -hmm. I mean, that follows up heroin too. It's just like he's doing like, heroin well while not like in the kind of the same boat while not the most successful record in the world it has this thing that ross robinson tends to do with bands where it's just like 
this doesn't sound like every other record they have, but it's definitely a right. a sculpted piece of clay that shows what happens when these artists work with Ross Robinson. <laughs> yes, it is. And yeah, it's a very similar trajectory at, from like going from Dear Diary to Heroin was mm-hmm. sonically very different. And just songwriting and everything was different. It was awesome. Yeah. Heroin one of my favorite records ever. Heck but, yeah. And um, have that connection, that West Borland connection. It's kind of just like, wow, that's awesome. really cool. And it's just like, if I recollect you, you like you don't you run into Wes or you've spoken to Wes since those days? Uh not recently, but years later, a different time that I moved to Los Angeles, I got a job at um a rehearsal and instrument rental place called Studio Instrument Rentals. And it was the first instrument rental and rehearsal spot founded in LA back in the 60s. And it's kind of, it's, they've got them in like New York, Nashville, whatever, but it's a more, I don't know, exclusive, like kind of high profile people rehearse there from yeah. Katy Perry to all this stuff. It's hard. It was hard to get a job there. I, me and my friend faked that we knew somebody that worked there and we were able to get hired somehow. It was amazing. When I got hired, <laughs> And it was, it's like LA people, they're kind of jaded, especially that work in like the, it's essentially like the music service industry. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> and they, they just weren't nice at all. And Limp Biscuit was rehearsing there. And I thought like, I was like, that's cool. Uh, and I was coming into work. It was like a private parking lot gated thing. Uh, I was coming into work as Limp Biscuit was getting out of their rehearsal and they were all walking back to their cars. And I passed Wes and I was like, I'm not going to say anything. It's been like, I didn't have that much like hang, like we didn't row down or like we didn't become friends when he was, he just kind of came in for a couple of days and did bass. And then I think we had dinner or something maybe. And um, this had probably been five, four years or so, five years since then. And I, I passed him and he looked at me. And I was like, I'm not going to say anything. And I kept walking. And then he turned around. He's like, Aaron? I was like, what's up, man? He's like, what are you doing here? And this all (laughs) happened right in front of my boss who just hired me, who was a dick. (laughs) And he saw that (laughs) interaction happen. And after that, I was in. It was so awesome. And I, yeah. But after that, uh, I know I'm not, I didn't really see him again oh uh, well i mean that's i mean that's pretty much like if you were ever to see him ever again like it, it could lead to like what if he doesn't remember you but my last story of him he does remember me he wouldn't want to we want of those but i feel like somebody like wes he's like you can't be that good at guitar and not have like a steel trap for a memory so who knows yeah i don't know but I mean, probably- I'm, I mean, i've never actually seen him on biscuit live and they just announced a tour with uh, Riff Raff and Corey Feldman. Yeah, yeah. You gotta go. <laughs> all like Midwest B markets, but it's uh, this summer and it's right around my birthday. So I think for my birthday, I'm going to take a trip out with some friends. Hell yeah, do it, dude. I, I, I'm in the same boat. I love Limb Biscuit. I've never seen Limb Biscuit live. I've never had Limb Biscuit. Oh, shit on them. And like, I get it, but I also don't get it because they're awesome. And yeah. I think they're cooler than ever now. Oh, yeah. Um, I run a, a certain Facebook group called uh, Durst Posting. So, um, I'm a big I'm a big fan of the the, the ship posting legacy that Limb Biscuit has always carried with them because it's always been kind of like tongue in cheek. It's always like, they're in on the joke that it is oh, the yeah. biscuit because it's like it's kind of like Primus sucks. I don't know if you you're familiar with the phrase. Yeah. They yeah. own that phrase. It's like yeah, Primus sucks. Heck yeah, we know it. We're all about it. Like come on oh, yeah. now, let's go. Let's go have fun and sing by my name is Mud. <laughs> I can't wait. I just saw them. Uh, so there's like a bunch of footage circulating around of them at this fe- of Limp Bizkit at this festival where they dressed up as cowboys. Have you seen this? 
It just on the back of it says New Metal Cowboys, but Fred Durst is just like full like rodeo. Like <laughs> they're totally not a joke. And they opened and closed the set with break stuff. I don't know. There's just there's not a cooler band. Yeah. You can't you can't beat Limb Biscuit at being Limb yeah, Biscuit. Yeah, there will never be there'll never be another Limb Biscuit. They somehow are able to um because new metal is such a genre where everything kind of just like, you know. I remember those bands, you know, but it's like Limb Biscuit is always going to be remembered for being Limb Biscuit. For sure, yeah, there's only one Limb Biscuit, that's for sure. Heck yeah, dude! I love that they're having fun with it. It's awesome, as as they should. I think at this point in their career, like they were already the biggest band on the planet. I mean, not many people, especially in the modern scene, can be like, "Oh yeah, our lead singer was on stage with Britney Spears and Christina Aguilera." Just kind of like you know, the biggest pop stars and all of, you know, like I don't think the biggest band. I remember this. I remember Wes bring this up, or uh, Ross bring this up when Wes was in the studio with us doing bass, and he's like. Dude, Limp Bizkit was the biggest band in the world for six years in the like early 2000s and night like late 90s. Crazy. Yeah. You just can't like they were all they were everywhere. They were not only just like on MTV, they were on like WWE, they were on video. I games, just saw like, that. They were doing the the intro for the Undertaker. Yeah. Rolling. And then they yeah. did the theme song for WrestleMania 17. Like they were. Yeah, my that was my way. I think that was that song for that. Okay, and it's just I remember like, that from the first Fast and Furious movie soundtrack. Were, exactly, they were Mission Impossible too. They were they 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 have that song. That song that song rips ass, dude. It's just so awesome. Good. Yeah, so good. It's still so it's like, good. Like how, how many bands can take a like a theme song from a TV show that's like 40, 60 years old, and it's just like this is this is now the coolest, heaviest riff song. Yep. <laughs> well, that's West Borland for you. You know if. If any band could do it and you know I'll, I'll, i'm a man that believes never say never if drop dead gorgeous came back and wanted to like go on tour with limb biscuit i think that would be really cool i think that'd be really cool too that might Heck be yeah let's put, let's put that out there uh it's gotta be a meme or something i'll make it i'll make a fake tour poster maybe west sees it and he'll call up aaron and be like aaron did you make that <laughs> <laughs> well fingers crossed <laughs> i think that would be really cool but i mean on a like on that topic though of a drop dead gorgeous reunion is it a never say never kind of situation or maybe or a nah Mm. i i was i mean never say never i don't see how that would ever be possible just personally inter- mm-hmm. interpersonally i don't think that would ever be a thing you know but never say never never say never you never know you know um there could be the return of warp tour could bring him back maybe west borland needs an opening band and he's like i really miss drop it gorgeous can i play bass real quick <laughs> <laughs> right there's things that I can make never. never came back. I mean, if okay, there's no like none of the guys have talked. I haven't spoken, but I think it'd be cool to do like because there's so many bands coming back and they're doing the reunion thing and they're doing the tours and they're releasing albums and stuff. I don't. I think I appreciate and like where Drop Dead exists, and that is in 2007. And so I, I I don't have any interest or desire to like make a record or work on new music, but I don't know if for some reason a thousand billion stars happened to a line that made it possible, I think it'd be fun to do like yeah. more shows and call it the old from the old from first to last method. Bring Skrillex back real quick and just do a couple two four shows and then right off into the sunset i i dig it you know and if we got those four shows i think if anything you know kyle deserves celebrating those riffs that music that time you guys definitely you were once in a, in a once in a lifetime thing i don't think i think there's only one drop dead gorgeous there's only one limp biscuit you know and no matter how much people try to replicate 
there's not going to be another drop dead gorgeous and the only way is people asking when are they going to come back and i think that it's a beautiful question i think it's, it's a question that it's incredible it's, it's actually incredible that there's even a like people who would even want that so that's by itself just mind-blowing to me and i think that's 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 a beautiful thing to have and that's what beautiful is to me, you know, I, I think. <laughs> but I, I think we've been gone over an hour. I don't want to take up all your time today, Aaron. I think that's a I think that's a great way to cap off an interview. And, and unless you have anything else you want to bring up or share or give to the people. No, I don't think so. I Heck think... Yeah, I'd really love people to check out these bands that I'm working with. Jake's a gentleman, Sophie Gray, Kayla Ruby. Heck yeah. And if you, and all the Instagrams and all the TikToks and all the stuff. But if you ever if you ever find yeah. yourself listening to moves, that stuff's great too. Oh yeah. <laughs> Might come back one day. I've got some unreleased stuff actually. But heck yeah, dude. And I don't know. If people wanted to follow you on social media, uh, is there a preferred place that you'd like them to go, or are you are you just Aaron Rothy everywhere? Aaron Rothy everywhere, yeah. So at Aaron Rothy, you want to find Aaron? You want to see who he's working with, who he's promoting? Check him out, man. He does great stuff. Thank you all for joining us today on Work Taste Podcast. I'm Ryan Rex Rex. This has been Aaron Rothy. Y'all have a great day. Bye.